Good morning. How are we doing? If you have your Bibles, would you please open them to Proverbs chapter 3? Proverbs chapter 3. Let me just take a moment while you're turning there to thank Dr. Moeller for this invitation, uh, to thank the faculty and staff here. Uh, this seminary has uh, just been an invaluable resource uh, and encouragement to me. Uh, I've told Dr. Moeller this story, and uh, I'll spare you this morning, but uh, the Lord used Southern Seminary uh, in my life at a time where I desperately needed it. Um, it found me uh, as a young pastor planting a church uh, with a sick child and uh, in turmoil theologically, and this place gave me roots. And I'm um, just forever indebted to people like Dr. Booker uh, and others who poured into me and for Dr. Moeller for his leadership. You are in an incredible place, one of the best institutions in the world, Christian or not. And it's really important for you to treasure that and to be knowledgeable what a gift it is to be here. So thank you, Dr. Moeller, once again. Um, let's read together Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six this morning. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. We're talking today with what I believe is one of the most foundational and important topics in the Christian life, though often misunderstood and not always very lived out. And that is the subject of trusting God, trusting in the Lord. Most people at some point in their lives, even over the course of their lives and consistently with various levels of intensity are going to deal with trials, with troubles. There's going to be suffering. There are going to be seasons of anxiety, depression, maybe struggles financially, maybe marital issues, health issues. Maybe there's questions about things that have happened in your past, a family divorcing or a cancer diagnosis, or we could continue on and on with the number of things that in this life happen even to Christians. Many things maybe that you've dealt with or are dealing with today. Maybe I didn't mention them. Maybe you're in pastoral ministry right now and the, the hurt, the struggles, the trials, the afflictions that you're facing are around pressures in the church. Maybe it's pressures uh, of leadership or uncertainty about whether or not there's a next step for you after school, or are you gonna find Mr. or Mrs. Wright or infertility issues, or we could keep going down the list until eventually we put our finger on the thing that maybe would resonate with you. And, and what you need to recognize is if you haven't gone through those things, or if you're not now going through those things, more than likely, because we live in a broken and fallen world, you will go through those things at some point. And I'm not talking about things that come as a result of our sinful actions, right? There's obviously consequences that come when we commit sin, right? If, if you commit adultery, don't be surprised if your marriage ends and your children resent you. Or if you steal money from your job, don't be surprised if you lose your job and then you struggle to pay your bills, right? These are the types of things that happen because we sin and then there is a consequence for that sin. But I'm not talking about that kind of suffering this morning. I'm not talking about those kind of struggles this morning. I'm talking about the kind that on the surface don't look like a result of anything that you've done. They're just part and parcel of life between the fall of man and the return of Christ. They're the things that will consume us in this life, that will war against our hearts and against our minds and things that we have to learn to deal with. It is this kind of reality, it is this kind of world filled with these kinds of afflictions that the Bible repeatedly says to us, trust God. Trust God, not in absence of those things, but very much in light of those things. Trust in the Lord. This passage that we just read is probably very familiar to you. Some of you maybe even have this verse on a coffee mug or t-shirt at home. But often our familiarity with a passage like this doesn't always equal understanding it. Being terribly familiar with the text doesn't always mean that we grasp what it's saying to us. And so I want us to look at this text with fresh eyes and with fresh understanding to understand what it is the Lord is saying to us in these passages. Look at this first this first phrase, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord, this is an exhortation. This is a command, 
right? This is a verb, trust in the Lord. The, the word trust means to rely upon or to put confidence in. And when you're trusting in something, when you're relying on something, when you're putting confidence in something, you're putting your trust or your reliance on the strength or the character of that object. So for example, when you get on an airplane, you are putting trust, you are putting confidence, you are relying upon the character, the strength, the integrity of that aircraft to get you where it's supposed to go. Some people, however, do not trust airplanes, so they do not fly. But whether or not you get on one or don't get on one is because of your trust. You're relying on or believing in the integrity of that thing. So watch, to trust in the Lord means to put a confidence in or reliance on the one whom you are looking to, in this case, the Lord, to be true to who he is, his character, his strength, his integrity is worth relying on. And in fact, this verb to trust, the Hebrew word there implies and kind of paints this picture for us of one that is lying down on the ground, vulnerable, back exposed, at the mercy of another. That requires trust to make yourself vulnerable in that kind of way before another. And that's the image here that we're given when we're told to trust in the Lord. Now notice this next phrase, with all your heart. With all your heart. The description of the composition of our trust and the nature of it is to be with all of our being. Not begrudging trust, not half hearted trust, with all of our mind and our will and our affections. We are called to trust the Lord with our whole being, with all of our heart, none withheld from Him. Now, listen, before I move any further, can I just ask you to examine your own heart for just a moment and ask yourself this question. If the Lord's glance was on your heart this morning, would he find a heart that's trusting him with everything? That's trusting him in everything. How, what a pity it is that creatures made by our creator and our maker, and if in Christ, our redeemer and our sustainer would struggle so mightily to trust him. If he did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, will he not give us all things? That's the question that Paul asked, and the answer is, well, of course he will. That's the kind of God he is. So what does it say about our hearts, and how, how much to be pitied are we that we don't trust that kind of God? who knows us and gives us all that we need for life and godliness. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and then listen to the next exhortation and do not lean on your own understanding. The contrast to trusting in the Lord is to lean on your own understanding. So we're told trust in the Lord with all your heart and then we're told what not to do, do not lean on your own understanding. This idea of leaning on your own understanding is really this picture of resting on something for support. You ever laid a, a, a beam, a two by four or something against a wall? You ever laid something against the wall? You're leaning it on something that you think will hold it up. Do not lean, the scriptures say, on your own understanding. Meaning, do not rest on, seek to find your comfort in, seek to find your support in what you're going through, the trials you're facing with your own understanding, your own capacity to make sense of it, your own ability to connect the dots to what you think God might be doing. Do not lean on what you can understand. Do not lean on what you can grasp or make sense of. Because friends, let me tell you, if you live long enough, there's going to be things you encounter that you'll never make sense of. You're not God. You, you don't have infinite wisdom. So to lean on our own understanding is faulty. It can't support the troubles, the trials, the struggles that life will and does bring. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. So much of the troubles in life that we face, the fears, the worries, are rooted in our fears about tomorrow. They're rooted in fears about the future. So many of our difficulties, so many of our struggles rely on what he points to in the passage, the question of whether or not he will make our path straight. 
At the end of the day, that's what we're all asking, isn't it? Is the Lord gonna make my path straight? Are things gonna be okay? And there's this sobering thing that happens. The, the more you live, the more in the word you are, is you come to this recognition that you are truly impotent. You are truly helpless and weak to control the future. You have no control of tomorrow. You don't control the next hour. You don't control next week. You don't control next month. You don't control next year. So at the end of the day, what we're always thinking about is what's gonna happen, what's gonna come next. And, and what, the, what the proverb is telling us to do is trust in the Lord in these moments and don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your ability to make sense of it. Because what we do is we live in fear about what we don't control. Even your past hurts inform this, right? If this happened to me once, it could happen again. If it happened to them, it could happen to me. And all of a sudden we let our mind think about the future that we don't control and we can find ourselves restless. You see, what's not uncommon today are trials and tribulations. What you will find very uncommon are hearts that are at rest in the midst of those troubles. Troubles and tribulations are not uncommon at all. What is uncommon is to find people who will trust in the Lord. So, so listen, the struggle that most of us have is rooted in this lack of control and it leaves us with two options every moment. Am I gonna trust the Lord or am I gonna lean on my own understanding? And I wish guys I could give the disclaimer and say, hey, this is grasping desperately to make sense. And here's what I would venture to say. That's not just true in congregations. It's likely true of people sitting in this room. Guys, it's easy to follow Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 when things seem to be going smooth in your life. It's when the trials and tribulations come that what we truly believe about God and whether or not we truly trust him begins to rise to the surface. What's there begins to be unearthed and we begin to see, are we trusting the Lord? Are we leaning on our own understanding? What, what marks us? And listen, I'm not here to try to condemn. I'm not here to try to make anyone fear, feel bad. I wanna help you. I wanna help you. I, I want you to live in freedom, not fear. I, I want you to experience peace through life's troubles, not panic. And I want you to be steady, grounded, even in the face of not controlling things instead of living scared about what tomorrow holds. I want you to live confident in God's plan for your future even when your past may be marked by hurts and troubles. And I'm not speaking to you today in theory. I'm a fellow traveler along this road. I was a young man. I was Newly married over a year when we discovered we were having our first child, our son, Caleb. I was 24 years old and hadn't had much experience with suffering or troubles and trials in my life. I have a mar a married parents still together, provided for us. And I somewhat developed this theology of suffering that said, yeah, bad things can happen in the world, but if you, if you are faithful and you follow the Lord, you probably will be exempt from the bad stuff. I was never taught that. I, I never even maybe would have articulated that, but it was under the surface. There was this expectation that, you know, if you're faithful, you know, you're not gonna get any bad things, not the bad, bad things. And then we discovered that my son had an issue going on in his abdomen when he was still uh, in the womb. And then he was born and we, we discovered that he had a bad kidney, he had cysts all over it. He was born premature and 
The doctors said, we, we got to get this kidney out and we needed to get him big enough to have surgery. So we waited a few months and it was this back and forth struggle with he's, he's continuing to get sick and we got to get him bigger. And, and they're finally like, we can't wait any longer. We got to take this kidney out. And he's got a good kidney. He'll live a perfectly normal life, a good kidney, no troubles. And so they went to surgery. And the surgery was over and we felt such a relief. We felt like this nightmare is behind us. We can go raise our child now. We don't have to be in the hospital anymore. And then several hours passed and then 12 hours passed and 18 hours passed and he still hadn't urinated and, and they were beginning to see him swell up and his blood pressure was rising and they did some tests and ran some um, ran some, some imaging and they discovered that not only had they taken out that bad kidney during that surgery, but they had removed his good kidney along with his bad kidney. And in, in a moment, in an instant, our whole lives were thrown upside down. And I had no theology of suffering to comprehend how to make sense of this. And so we went through a period of two years where my son would go through dialysis We'd go to the hospital for hours at a time. His blood would circulate through a machine waiting for a kidney transplant. At two years old, my son received a kidney transplant. And all of the while, not only are we walking with him in his physical reality, but we're trying to make sense theologically about how do things like this happen and where is God in the midst of this? And we're on a journey to go, can we trust God about this future? Because now here's the reality. Now my son forevermore is going to be on medications. These kidneys, a kidney transplant doesn't last forever. At some point he'll have to have another one. This is probably gonna shorten his lifespan. And now I'm living with a whole new set of daily fears of things I don't control. I began to experience crippling anxiety, never had anything like that before. A panic attack that felt like I was having a heart attack. I was 24 years old. And I didn't know how to make sense of any of these things. And as my son finally gets a transplant at two and life begins to stabilize a little bit, we're, we're all learning together. As my son ages, I'm having to teach him about what happened to him and about trusting the Lord in his life as I'm even preaching to myself as I'm talking to him about those things. That's also where Southern Seminary came in as a massive part of my life and as a gift from God to help me to make sense of where is God in the midst of these things? Because see, the scriptures are not silent on these things at all. My son from ages two to 13 lived a pretty normal life like most people. Of course, we went to the hospital all the time. He was on medication constantly. He dealt with respiratory issues as a side effect, but compared to the first two years, it was normal. He went to school, he played sports, he was a long-suffering Tennessee Vols fan like his dad, right? We went to ball games together. He went to camps when I would go speak at student camps. I mean, he, he was, if you didn't know, he was just like anyone else. But in the fall of 2017, my son got sick and went to the hospital. And within a week of being there, he went unconscious for three weeks. And they discovered that he had something called fungal meningitis and he had a stroke. And when he finally came to three weeks later, he had no motor skills. He couldn't speak. He couldn't use his hands and his legs. And we began a period of months of rehabilitation. We went and lived in Atlanta in a rehab facility where he regained much of his motor skills, but he never recovered his speech. My 13 year old boy's life was turned upside down all over again from playing video games with his buddies to not even being able to talk. Within a year of rehab, he began to regress because of neuro pains and he quit being able to walk. He was wheelchair bound, eventually to the point where he lived in constant pain and we were changing him like an infant, caring for him around the clock. In November of 2019, he went into the hospital for a respiratory infection, which we had been many, many times for the same issue. And we expected it would be just like every other time. We go in, we get antibiotics, we're there two or three weeks, we go home. That was just life for the Reed family. We understood it. Our girls understood it. We kicked into hospital mode. Except friends, this time my son didn't go home. Doctors came and told us that he wasn't gonna get better. And so me and my wife and my girls, along with family and friends, stood around his bedside and gave thanks to God for his life 
gave thanks to God for his salvation and redemption awaiting. But we said goodbye to my son, December 1st, 2019. Four years later, and all throughout those 15 years, I can tell you that that journey of learning to trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding is not something that's theory for me. I'm still having to choose to trust every single day. Often thoughts will come to my mind about if the Lord gives me 40 more years and I live in to be 80, will I remember what his little voice sounded like? You know, will the memories that I had with him when I was in my 20s still be there? Or were they, and, and, and watch, and these types of thoughts, if I feed them and I just keep, if I just keep focusing on them, they start stirring up that anxiety and that fear and that worry. And I have to remember, no, 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 Eric, don't lean on your own understanding. You can trust the Lord. If he gives you 40 more years, he'll give you the grace you need 40 years from now. You don't need it today for 40 years ahead. You need today's grace for today's troubles and you can trust that the Lord will meet you 40 years from now if you need it then, because you will. Don't lean on your own understanding. What's the answer to dealing with these kinds of things in life? Here's what the Bible's answer is, trust in the Lord. And that sounds so, so simplistic to us that it can't possibly be practical, right? That, that sounds so cliche and trite, you know, just trust the Lord. Because don't people say that oftentimes? But listen, is it practical? Is it practical to trust in the Lord? The answer is yes, it's, it's the key to everything. Trusting in the Lord is the key for finding peace in the midst of 10,000 things that can trouble you in this life. How do we do it? How do we trust in the Lord? The emphasis that I wanna stress this morning is that trusting in the Lord is not something that you can turn on and off like a light switch, friends. The moment you need it, you can't just go there and flip it on. It is not something that you can conjure up by sheer force of will. It must be cultivated. Trust in the Lord is something you cultivate. It is something that is nurtured. It is something that grows. It is something that is developed. And the way that it's developed is through communion and fellowship with God. You must know him. Think about this. That's what, that's what we have in the gospel. We don't just have forgiveness of sins so that we have heaven one day. The, the invitation is that we are reconciled in order to know him, to walk with him. First Peter 3, 18, Christ suffered once for sinners, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? That he might bring us to God. Paul in Philippians 3 talks about, he counts everything as rubbish for a surpassing worth that surpasses every other thing. And what was that all surpassing worth? What was it? knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He doesn't say knowing about him, knowing him, fellowship with him, walking with him. This is what God has done in giving Christ to us. Jesus's death and resurrection opens the door, removes the veil and gives us access to God Almighty. And in that fellowship and in that relationship, now we can see trust cultivated, trust developed. It's, it's embedded right there in the verse. Look again, we are to trust what? In the Lord. Trusting in the Lord. It's specifically in the character and person of God that's to garner our trust. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. I want you to think about that phrase, in all your ways, acknowledge him. What he's not saying, by saying acknowledge him, doesn't mean to give God a tip of the cap, right? I acknowledge you. It's not to give him a shout out at the end of your acceptance speech. That's not the acknowledgement we're talking about here. What's the root word right in the middle of acknowledge? What's the word there? To know. In all your ways, know him. Know who you are dealing with. Think about it. It makes complete sense if you begin to reflect on it. How does your trust in anyone develop and get nurtured? In relationship with them. As you are in relationship with people, you come to what? Know them. 
And the more you know them, the more you either trust them or don't trust them. But what is it rooted in? What is it based on? It's based on you know them. The more you know someone's character, the more you know whether or not you can trust them. And the same is true with trusting God. The more you know him, the more you trust in the Lord, and you're in that ongoing fellowship and relationship with him, the more you are understanding the character of the God that you fellowship with, the more trust, watch this, is cultivated. It's a fruit. It's a fruit. You can't staple fruit to a tree, can you? I I mean, you can, but what happens to it? Well, you don't have to be an an ag major to answer that. How, what happens if you staple fruit to a tree? It rots because it's not natural to the tree. You can't staple trust onto the tree of your life just because you need it in the moment to come. It has to be cultivated. And, And it gets cultivated with roots in your life planted deeply in the soil of who God is, his character. You see, the more that you understand God as sovereign and wise and loving and faithful and good, the more your trust will grow. Friends, the more that you begin to recognize that God is sovereign over all things, when people do wicked and evil things, remember Joseph said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God was at work bringing about his purposes and plans. God was doing something. He was making the path straight. Now watch, this is where we struggle. We want to read and he will make your path straight and we want to immediately define what that means for us. Straight for me, God, looks like this. That's not the promise. He will make your path straight according to his good design and plans. And trusting him means I'm relying on what he decides, not on me getting to write the script. He's sovereign over everything, which means he can bring all things to pass. No one can thwart his will. But not only is he sovereign, the Bible makes it very clear he does all things according to the counsel of his will. He is wise in all of his doings, which means he knows what's best. And not only does he know what's best, he has the power to bring it about. Now watch, why is that important in your life to remember? Why is that important in your life to preach to yourself and get your roots deep down into that? Because if you truly believe it, then you know that nothing whatsoever can come to pass in your life without passing through his sovereignty and wisdom. And then when you take into account the fact that in Christ you are beloved and he's faithful to you and he's good, he's not not playing games with you. You're not fodder for some for some fun game that God's playing. You are loved by God. He's faithful to his promises. He's good in all of his ways. He's sovereign in all of his actings and he's wise in all of his plans. The more your heart, watch this, not just grasp that that's true, but is living in the reality of that truth. As you fellowship with him, those roots will bear the fruit of trusting God. Peace with God the peace that you so desperately want in this life doesn't come because this life is gonna give you ease and comfort. It comes because the God who is over this life and who loves you is a God that you can trust in all things. You can trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him, acknowledge him. And the promise at the end of these three exhortations is he will make your path straight. As a father of three children, at some point with all of them, I've set them on a ledge of some sort, a wall, a countertop, and have done the classic dad move, jump. I have never seen a mom do this, by the way. This is completely a dad move. And I've put them up there and I've, I've said, come on, jump, I'll catch you. And you know, some kids immediately, they don't even need the invitation. They're off the counter, right? But, but most kids, many, they're living in that hesitation of I wanna trust you, I wanna jump, I wanna jump. 
And I'm terrified at the same time. What if you don't catch me? That drop looks pretty far. That floor is going to hurt. And they vacillate back and forth. Now, let me ask you a question. As a father, as a father, if my children are struggling to jump, they don't trust me. How does he think it makes me feel as a father? Because here's what I know, without a shadow of a doubt, I'm catching them. There's not even a possibility I'm not catching them. But they're struggling. They're, wa- they're waffling. They're wavering. And I'm like, come on, I got you. Now, what if after five, 10 minutes of just, you know, haggling with them to jump, 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 they finally jump. But I'm like, you know what? You didn't trust me on the first invitation. And I just step back and let them fall. Right? Unthinkable, right? I would never do that. But just imagine, you know, what kind of dad would I be? What kind of dad would I be if I said, nope, you should have trusted me the first time. You lost your chance for me to catch you. If I, as an imperfect dad and father, and willing to catch my kids, no matter how many times my kids have struggled to trust me and jump. How willing is our Father in heaven to catch us when we finally decide we're not gonna keep leaning on our own understanding. We're not gonna keep letting our lack of control about the future and our incessant worry about things we don't control continue to guide us and and govern our hearts and affections. We're gonna trust him. We're gonna lean on him. We're gonna run to him. Do you think he's gonna step out of the way and say, no, you've blown it too many times. Remember that thing you didn't trust me with? Remember that worry you do every night? You know that little pattern you go through where you're so convinced that things are gonna be bad for you or that I'm not gonna be faithful to you in all that you go through? He doesn't do that to us. He invites us to trust him. And friends, if you are in Christ this morning, he did not spare or withhold anything from you. You can trust him with everything. In this life, you will have troubles, Jesus says, but take heart. I've overcome the world. There are great, precious promises that are ours in Christ. And so you could lose everything in this life, but as is written on my son's tombstone, To live is Christ and to die is gain. And all the promises of God that we have remind us that we can trust him in this life because he has given us promises far beyond just this life. So trust him, friends. Trust him in the smallest of things and trust him with the greatest of things. And do not lean on your own understanding because our God is the one who makes paths straight. So trust him with all your heart. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for what an encouragement it is to our souls. We need it so desperately, Lord, because our hearts are so fickle. Our minds are so quick to dart and to race onto all kinds of fears and worries. We feed our hearts with fear about tomorrow and things we don't control. And we plot out scenarios of worst case worst case uh, scenarios and, and circumstances in our lives instead of resting in you. And I know that's true of of people in this room today, just as much as it's true for people outside of it. And I know that there are many here that are engaged in studies and in ministry and perhaps more than the average Christian has a knowledge and an education beyond the average individual. I, I pray that in the midst of all of this, that our knowledge of you would not simply become intellectual candy, but that it would serve to feed our soul's trust in you. That we would turn every study, every opportunity to read your word and to fellowship with others, to read books, that all of it would serve to know and trust you more. That in the midst of busyness, we wouldn't neglect fellowship with you, communion with you, Oh, Lord, I pray that these students, these faculty, even myself today, would be renewed in our desire to know and trust you more because you are good. Jesus, we love you. Thank you that we have these great promises because of what you have done for us. We pray all these things in your great name. Amen. Amen. Let's respond by standing and singing.
question and then answer. Yes, where is all your hope and peace? Only in the blood of Jesus. And where is all your righteousness? Only in the blood of Jesus. And tell me. grace of that Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We are dismissed.